Hi, my name is Chris Parkhurst. I'm a documentary filmmaker, and I'm also the host of the Documentary Life podcast, a show that spans 140 episodes, has been downloaded in over 135 countries, and uh, I've been producing for about five years. I decided to put each and every episode up here onto YouTube to sort of expand the audience, and as we say in the show, maybe inspire and inform some more doc filmmakers, hopefully like yourself. Um, in the episodes, you may find some older, maybe outdated URLs, in particular, any of the documentary filmmaking courses that we do offer online. If you have any questions about the URLs, simply look in the show notes on this page here on this YouTube page, and that'll be able to take you where you need to go to. Other than that, I hope you enjoy the show, and uh, it's great to have another listener to The Documentary Life. Have a great day. Hello. Hello, Justin. Hey there. So you're, you, you sounds like you're able to hear me on my end. Yeah, let me just put on my headset. I mean, it sounds, it sounds great. Oh, yeah? But it wasn't until about six months in that he just very openly kind of sat me down and said, this is what I'm, I've been contemplating for a while. And, um, you know, I want my last political act to be my suicide. I wasn't surprised, but it's still shocking that somebody will say that to you and say it to you on camera and I'm holding the camera and trying to figure out, um, you know, what the heck do I do now? Hello and welcome to The Documentary Life, a show that sets out to inspire and inform you on how to best live and lead your own documentary life. I am your host, Chris G. Parkhurst, and this is episode number 20. And it is brought to you by Barong Films, proud creators of Documentary Film, The Documentary Life Podcast, and The Documentary Academy, our industry-changing A to Z documentary filmmaking program that will transform you into the documentary filmmaker that you've always wanted to be. Find out more at thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. Today's podcast marks our monthly doc industry guest segment of the show. Shortly after the new year, documentary filmmaker, and I am happy to say regular listener of TDL, Justin Shine reached out to make me aware of his latest documentary film, Left on Purpose. I am always flattered when a listener takes the time to tell me about his or her project, and even more so when they want to share the finished film with me. Now, I obviously can't have every listener who reaches out to me with their doc on the show, but like I said, I do take everyone's projects very seriously, and I am honored that they shared with me. From time to time, if I think it beneficial for my audience, I will even have them on the show as a guest. You'll remember, I think it was back in October when I had on doc filmmaker and listener of the show, Brian Jenkins, who discussed his project answering the call. Well, Justin is definitely one of those people, and his film, Left on Purpose, is most definitely one of those films, which I feel we all can benefit from. The film is now available on iTunes, Amazon, and Vimeo, just to name a few of its platforms. I can assure you, after having now watched the film myself twice, and after you hear this show, you will want to go watch the film yourself. It is truly a unique story that we as documentary filmmakers often hope that we ourselves will get to film at least once in our lifetimes. Justin is a fortunate man to have had this story sort of fall in his lap. That being said, Justin is also a very articulate, compassionate, talented, and dedicated documentary filmmaker. And all of these things are on full display here in this film. So, why don't we get to my conversation with documentary filmmaker Justin Shine, shall we? What would be a great way to sort of start this out would be to sort of just give us a little bit about your background and how you came to be a documentary filmmaker. You know, I was in high school and as a younger person, I was interested in, in photography and photojournalism um, and saw that as a, as a kind of wonderful way to express yourself and to learn about the world. Um, but photography and photojournalism seem to be a fading art form yeah. um, and one that kind of required uh, increasing amount of danger if you wanted to participate. Um, and so I decided to you know, pursue film as a way to find that outlet and documentary film in particular. Um, and so I didn't go to film school until, until I was in grad school. I started making films in high school with friends and um, still taking photographs and, you know, see 
documentary film as a kind of this amazing passport that has allowed me to travel the world and investigate stories and meet people that I never would have had the the honor to. So for me, it's as much a craft as it is kind of a, a life experience. You mentioned uh, that you that you were making videos as a as a high schooler. I I, I think that you and I um, are roughly the same age. Did you where you went to high school? Did you guys perchance have a video department? Did you have a TV or radio station? Because when I went to to, to high school. It was sort of the tail end of, of the radio station and video that we had on campus that, of course, with budget cuts in the early 90s, disappeared pretty quickly. Did you guys have that there at your high school? Um, we didn't. I took a photography course in high school. And, um, you know, when I was in college, uh, I purpose I thought about film school and purposefully decided to get more of a kind of a broader education. But I took mm-hmm. film classes at NYU during the summer. Um you know, 16 millimeter. I took a radio class in college where we were splicing, you know, uh, tape. Um, oh, my yeah. first job out of out of um, college was as an assistant editor on this massive um, historical documentary, 16 millimeter. Uh, <laughs> so it was my job to, you know, keep hundreds of hours of footage. <laughs> Way to get uh, thrown to the fire, my friend. Yeah. And, you know, as much as I'm not an editor, I mean, being in the edit room is a wonderful place for a filmmaker uh, and a documentary filmmaker to learn their craft and the storytelling and even camera work. It teaches you how to shoot a scene and what's working, what's not. So uh, it was a really good experience. It's a, Yeah, it's funny that you bring that up. It's massively – I talk about this quite often. It's massively sort of helped me along my career. I came up – um, I came up through the ranks as an editor. And so I sort of had that editing yeah. background and then transitioning into a DP director role. I found it instrumental in the way that, well, obviously the way I shot things and the way that I was able to direct things, having that editing background. Yeah. It was definitely super helpful for me. Yeah. One of the things I wanted to bring up was we had another documentary filmmaker, Brian Jenkins on the show a few months ago he, like yourself, was somebody who had reached out to me. He was a listener of the show, and he reached out to me with his film, which makes me, for one, that makes me super happy. I'm obviously trying to build a bit of a documentary community here and, and build a forum where people can network and discuss their pro, you know, their projects, and then everybody learn from one another, right? Yep. How did you hear about the show, Justin, and then why did you reach out and feel that, you're, you know, that your film is appropriate for it? Well, you know, there are not that many um, shows that that cover documentary filmmaking the way you do, and uh, I really appreciate it. And um, you know, when you spend four plus years working on something, <laughs> you want a chance to talk about it and share. I feel like this film, uh, Left on Purpose, uh, is deeply important to me for many reasons, and one thing that that drove me to make it was uh, my interest in the, the, the issues it brings up as a filmmaker. Um, so I thought it, it would really be worthwhile to share it with filmmakers and people interested in not just the stories, the, the layers of story in the film, but also the, 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 the issues of filmmaking that it brings up. I'm so excited to be able to talk about the film here in a little bit. But just before we get to that, um, mm-hmm. In your bio, it says that you tend to focus your dot work, your doc work on social issues. Do you consider yourself an activist filmmaker? Is there a difference between the two? Um, yes, I do think that there's there's a difference, and I don't see myself as an activist, or I would say, you know, an advocacy filmmaker. I don't, right. um, I didn't, I don't believe in. Well, believe is maybe not the right word. I'm not comfortable making films where I start off with a premise and then set out to prove it. Um, I'm much more interested in finding issues that interest me, um, whether it be uh, guns or homelessness or, you know, prostitution. I mean, I've dealt with a lot of issues, um, but going in with an open mind and looking for characters whose lives are impacted by these issues and, and trying to better understand the issues by telling their stories. Um, doesn't mean I don't have my own opinion. Um, but 
for one thing, I'd like to keep an open mind because that experience will impact my my opinion, the way I see something. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I don't think preaching or uh, a dogmatic way of, of telling a story is is the most effective. Um, uh, and things are more complicated than uh, than black or white. And so the beauty is kind of in that gray area. And I find that as a someone who watches films, I, I like to to be given that opportunity to think for myself. So, yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I, I appreciate that opportunity. I, I don't really tend to gravitate towards the heavy handed stuff. I think I may have earlier, earlier in my years, I guess, in my career, I, I tended to gravitate towards in, uh, narrative, in narrative films. It would have been Oliver Stone in documentary. It would have been Michael Moore, but I think, and not that I, I, I don't want to say that I grew out of, out of that, but I started to understand at least the interest and power and importance for me, both as a filmmaker and as a consumer of films that I didn't want somebody to tell me exactly how, how I needed to think. I wanted to, I wanted to be allowed to have my own thoughts, uh, you know, about, about the particular subject. Your, your 2009 film, no impact man premiered at Sundance. How was the Sundance? How did you find the Sundance experience? And did you find that it opened doors to you later on as, as a doc filmmaker? Um, I found the Sundance experience to be slightly overwhelming. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, it was, it's always a great opportunity. It puts your film, uh, you know, on the map in a way that, that no other festival does. Right. Um, and the people there were you know very, um, wonderful in, Kind of seeing the importance of the film and giving us an opportunity, um, you know, it's not my strong suit. You know, um, kind of uh, capitalizing on these social situations in order to um, further my career, uh, but you know, certainly uh, having it uh, that film uh, show at Sundance has been helpful in raising money. Uh, and in kind of developing other projects, I, I um, left on purpose was partially and largely funded by a Sundance documentary grant. Um, so I would say having No Impact Man had you know screened there was helpful with that. Um, but it's not a you know it's not a panacea <laughs> that kind of <laughs> opens. I mean you know it's amazing. I have I have friends that have been nominated for Academy Awards. You know it doesn't inherently mean you're going to get funding for your next project. No, it um, sure doesn't, it's, it's, uh, in, in particular yeah. in, in our world, in the documentary world. And, you know, I think that um, one could say that those few, those handful of kind of um, well-known festivals have uh, too much power in a way um, mm-hmm. because a lot of other festivals, you know, look to them to, to for their programming. Um, and... Uh, that can close the doors for kind of more complex or, you know, there's, there's only so many films that can, can make it to Sundance. So, well, it's kind of like, um, not unlike sort of the grant cycle whereby, you know, if you get a well-known grant, it, it obviously gives to other grant awarding organizations, seeing your name attached to, um, a well-known grant organization. It's this sort of recognition that, well, if, if this guy liked it over here, then, well, we, we need to be attached to that too. And I yeah. think the same thing obviously happens in film festivals as sure. well. And that's of course, as you, as you're hinting at, um, it's good and bad. Yeah. Let's talk about the film, man. Let's talk about left on okay. purpose. Uh, why don't you tell, let's, let's start off by telling my listeners how you first came to the project how you knew about this man, Mayor Vishner, and and in this, in your answer, make sure to obviously explain who he is for people that don't know. Sure. Well, as you said, I, I had made that film, um, No Impact Man, that premiered at Sundance in 2009, and that was a story of a family trying to live in New York for a year with as little environmental impact as possible. Yeah. Kind of a you know, character-driven story about our, our environment and how we interact with it. Um, and one of the things they were trying to do was to grow their own vegetables. And Mayor Vishner happened to be the only guy at their community garden down, you know, down the block from them that was growing vegetables. 
Uh, oh wow! Okay. <laughs> so uh, if you see Noah Pac Man again, you'll you'll recognize the mayor. It has a small but really wonderful role. Amazing! Um, I need to go back and see it again. Yeah. That's that's great. He, and he's, and what's so great about him in that movie is that he's, I mean, he was who he is is a lifelong activist, yeah. peace activist, anti-war activist, and he was able to kind of criticize the No Impact Project, you know, from the inside with great. Um, great, uh, precision. Um, yeah. and so we got to be friends and, uh, I, he, mayor had been one of the original yippies, which was, um, the, uh, youth international party in the late sixties that were fighting against the Vietnam war. Um, and he had never, you know, never bowed, never uh, given up the fight, uh, for social justice. And, um, he was living in the same, tiny apartment in the, in the village, mm. Greenwich village in New York. And, you know, as I've said, growing up in New York, you see these characters walking down the street that you, that seems steeped in history. And it's, it's so rare that you get a chance to kind of open that door and, and see what, where they're coming from. And mayor seemed to be one of those guys. And since we were friends, I saw this opportunity to learn more about him and see the world through his kind of brilliant, but, you know, decaying, he seemed to yeah. be decaying, but at the time I didn't know how much, um, it kind of felt a little like a great garden situation. Oh, man. <laughs> um, uh, and I, you know, there's, that's a great opportunity yeah. that I saw. You you mentioned this idea of decay, and you know that's one of the first things that that you know we see when we when we go with you into his into his apartment. Uh, did you meet with him in his apartment before actually filming, before doing filming? Yeah, because I, I filmed him in, in uh, Noah Pac Man in his apartment, and okay, the first the first time I, I yeah, met what, him, what was the impression the, there for you? He, I opened the door and he, he wasn't wearing his pants. Oh man, and uh, I was like. Um, Okay, and he's like, "Well, if there's no children around, I'm not wearing my pants in my own apartment." Um, he was, you know, a very strong character and very odd, um, but kind of charming and right. uh, uh, really brilliant uh, and difficult. So uh, I said, "Okay," and in Noah Pac Man, he he put on his pants for me, but um, uh, you know, slowly it became clear that he was really. Uh, uh, struggling more than I had I had thought, um, Justin. I, I just want to back up for for one yeah. second here because it, it's it struck me as we're talking about this, and I could be wrong, but I believe the first time, I believe the first time we actually see Mayor in his apartment, you're filming him, and then it struck me as you walked into the bedroom. There's a moment where where there's there's a great reveal, <laughs> and we yeah. see not only what 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 he lives in, but we see him in his underwear. Was yeah. that intentional on your part, or was that that beautiful accident that often happens as doc filmmakers? Well, it was uh, it, it was interesting. I mean, yes, there's a reveal. I, I, I say to him, you know, why don't you show me around the place? I mean, it's literally a, like a, a room and a half, and yeah. it's piled with stuff. And unless but, you have a, a super wide angle lens, it's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but each you know each pile, each corner had its had its history, and oh. so he you know moves over to the chair. And he goes, "This chair has my pants," and <laughs> I pan down, and you see that he's not wearing his pants. Um, and it's true that's the chair he always kept his pants. Um, um, so I think it was. Uh, <laughs> It was a little bit of both. I mean, I, yeah. uh, um, you know, I think that I don't know that I could have made this film ten years ago. I feel like I um, had a, I have a certain level of experience and maturity that allowed me to to move forward with it. Yeah, and, <laughs> I think I know uh, exactly. And reveal something about. like that. Yeah, um, yeah, that's great. But the first time, uh, I mean, it, it's a, it's a question of um storytelling that i really had to rely on my co-director and editor david melman to help me with which was how when do you reveal somebody's um uh squad you know the, the their difficulties their their dark side right. um and can you uh do you have to reveal it up front i mean how do you tell a story like this in a way that's um that's watchable 
Mm. Um, and that was a real challenge uh, in this film. I'm here to uh, pick up for mayor. Mayor, 1750. Thank you very much. Did Mr. Yu give you a hard time? No, he was very nice. Good. Let me just wipe the notes here. Hold on. I just wanted to touch base on this beer delivery situation, because I have mixed feelings about it. Well, I can pay you if that's what... Well, I think, I mean, I think you should. I guess the issue for me, or the question for me, and I know the Heisenberg Principle is part of this, so my filming is impacting your life, but I feel better about making deliveries if it's acknowledged on camera. But your drinking is something that's really not healthy. Right, and, and you don't want to be an enabler. Yes, I don't want to be an enabler. And that's another question for me is like, what are the ethics of documenting somebody that's not necessarily capable of giving their consent? You have my consent. Right. If we proceed with this project to any length, right. you know, <laughs> this, this will not be the toughest ethical well, question we'll confront. <laughs> It's clear that you guys develop a, a strong and close friendship in this film. And that becomes a big part of the film. Now, this happens with our subjects, right? We, 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 we can fall in love with our subjects. It happens as doc filmmakers. Is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? And how, how, might, it, you know, sort of, how might it interfere with our abilities to remain as documentary filmmakers or maybe as yeah. objective documentary filmmakers? Yeah, objective is a tough is a tough word and tough yeah. concept. I mean, I personally believe in the kind of filmmaking I like to do that it's all about relationships, mm -hmm. and there needs to be an honest um, relationship. Uh, I mean, obviously, there's a there's a give and take, and you're uh, both you and your subject are both um, giving and and getting something, right? Um, and and we'll talk usually, a bit about that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, usually that's um, that's kind of the, the status quo, and things are not so. Um, it's not that important to reveal th what's going on there. Um, hmm. But as this film un unfolded, it became clear to me that I couldn't kind of hide behind the camera. That I needed to, you know, my experience and my point of view and the impact the film was having on me needed to be uh, exposed. Uh, I see. Okay, so this was a decision that you made on the fly. You didn't go into this knowing this film was going to be about about you and Mayer or your guys' relationship. Yeah. This is something that transpired through the film, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's always that possibility. So, yeah. you know, I leave the camera running um, sometimes, uh, certainly for my questions and things like that. Yeah. I mean, the film opens with... Uh, you know, with a genuine dialogue because Mayer had asked me to buy beer for him. <laughs> and I was very uneasy about that because, you know, I don't want to, I didn't know his relationship to booze. And so I did it. I didn't, but I also thought we should discuss it on camera because yeah, it's great. I thought if it got, if it, things got complicated, that it would be good to have that. But, you know, I'm not really framing it because I'm just kind of talking to him. Um, and he uh, it's such said, a great way to, to open it, right? I mean, it yeah. really, and for me as, as, a, as a filmmaker, I kind of geek out on that because it's, you're revealing immediately, you're setting sort of the, sort of the rules of the film, if you will, or opening it up to, this is the relationship we're going to have here as the viewer and as the filmmaker. There's going to be some ethical things we're, we're dealing with here. <laughs> and yeah. I love seeing that right from the get-go. Yeah, Mayor kind of has this glint in his eye. And he says, uh, if you, you know, if you're worried about the drinking, you know, this is not the, the biggest ethical challenge we're going to be oh, facing. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. And he, exactly. you know, he knew more than I did at that point. And yeah. Kind of in, in an interesting way, he had the power. Um, oh, so. for sure. Well, and, and that brings me to, to, again, a great segue. At what point did you know that suicide was on the table? This wasn't yeah. the impetus for filming from the, from the no. beginning, right? Not at all. I mean, yeah. I, you know, I had never, um, it hadn't touched me at that point in my life 
before, uh, you know, little by little within the first few months, he seemed to clearly be depressed. Um, and he, I would say, let's go to this protest. Um, and he would go and he'd get there and he'd be like, uh, this isn't for me, my time's over. Yeah. And he'd go home. And, but it wasn't until about six months in that he just very, um, openly kind of sat me down and said, this is what I'm, I've been contemplating for a while. And, um, you know, I want my last political act to be, uh, my suicide. And I could say I wasn't surprised, but it's still shocking mm -hmm. that somebody will say that to you and say to you on camera and I'm holding the camera and trying to figure out, um, you know, what the heck do I do now? Um, right, right. I'm uh, dying of loneliness. I'm dying of lack of human contact. And, uh, and I don't want to do this anymore. I mean, he says, you know, I don't see it getting any better than this, which is one of many heart-wrenching moments in the film, right? So, so how do you continue on not only just as a filmmaker, but sort of as a human being, seeing this suffering, right? And in some ways, suffering yourself, right? So how do you continue on as a filmmaker and as a friend? And, and, and that's where we start to get into these ethical issues, right? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think um, that's the question. I mean, as a filmmaker, uh, I mean, to be honest, that those are questions that, I, that fascinate me and that I yeah. want to explore. Yeah. Um, but also, I have to think about my kind of legal responsibility, mm. my ethical responsibility, you know, will the film be, uh, the filmmaking process be a good thing or will it, um, kind of just be a, a something that, uh, encourages him. Uh, and right, he was pretty right. clear, you know, as a yippie, if you, if you learn about the yippies, they were all about, about stunts. They were about, um, spectacle. Yeah. And, so he was saw this as an opportunity to um, kind of do something. So, you know, after that, I, I had to, you know, I stopped. I spoke to to a million people. I spoke to my wife, yeah. most importantly, about it. Um, I spoke to lawyers. I and I spoke to his doctor and his psychiatrist. Um, and it was a constant process of being in touch with these people, and and particularly his caregivers, um, to make sure that they felt that the filmmaking was a positive thing for him. Um, and at the time they did, they felt like it was, you know, giving him an outlet to, to feel appreciated. And, um, I do think that, uh, his friends also felt like that this may, that maybe we could hold up a mirror to, to him and his life and he could see some, some hope. You know, I can tend to be at times cynical, you know, about these sorts of things. And you know, I want to say for the record, I found how you handled the entire thing very real. I found it very human. I mean, what a delicate process. You know, you mentioned you went with him to therapy. You went with him to his doctor's appointments. You were meeting with his closest friends. Um, yeah, I, 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 I found it. Yeah, I mean, there's you couldn't have handled it in a, in a better way in the situation that you were in. And I, I really appreciated that. So somewhere along the line, it becomes clear to the viewer, right? That you're grappling with either putting down the camera because he's telling you that he's going to commit this act or continuing the filming in hopes of prolonging his life or maybe even changing his mind. Right. So, yeah. so how are you handling, handling this the entire time? with him and how are you dialoguing with him i mean i assume there's as a filmmaker there's there's plenty and plenty of footage and moments where you must be addressing this with him directly right yeah and there's a t there's a lot of footage um yeah yeah i mean it was it, it, i was trying to take it slow um i wanted to um you know first of all you grapple with uh, what your role is um you know on most films you you know, I grew up watching uh, Cinema Verite and the Maisel's brothers, they're there, but you're trying not to be too intrusive mm. into the story, mm. even though clearly you are 
um, creating the story by being there. Right. Um, so it's always that dance that you're doing. Uh, and so I, uh, slowly became clear that I needed to, to be a voice in the film and I needed to talk to him about what our relationship was. And, you know, our relationship actually became an important part of the film. Um, I was interested in finding out, you know, who he really was. Um, both as a young activist, but how he got to this place where he was so unhappy. Mm. Um, and I felt like he had so much to give. Um, and, you know, he had so much to give as an activist. He, I kind of, in some ways, made him part of my family. And I brought my, ki my kids to, to his garden where right. he uh, taught my son how to plant garlic. And he was really, you know, so... Um, wonderful with him. I think that's a moment where I feel like he's, you know, he shines. Um, and Again, another one of those heartbreaking moments that, that I'm referring to, you know, I felt in that moment watching, you know, watching him with your with your son and, and, and it should be noted, you know, both to my listeners as well as you that I have, you know, my wife, Steph and I have a three year old and, and a 10 month old. And so there yeah. were, there were definitely some moments that kind of touched me and hit home here because of sort of personal connections and recognizing certain things and the way that, that, that mayor handled, um, yeah, the, uh, your oldest boy and, and planting yeah. the garlic is, is a very, very touching moment. And I just felt, man, this guy just, <laughs> he just needs love. You know, it's like he just yeah. needs somebody. Um, and then, you know, so on a personal level, even aside from being a filmmaker, you're like, how do, how do you help somebody that is so needy? Yeah. Um, and is it possible to, and what, what can you do to be there for somebody that you really care about? Um, you know, you, and, but you respect, um, and who is suffering, uh, clearly he was suffering from you know, clinical depression. Right. Um, so his, his glass was always half empty. You would try to, um, you know, give him options and opportunities and make suggestions. And, um, and he just, uh, as much as he talked about being lonely, he was pushing the world away. Uh, Certainly. So it's tough. And, and it's something that people all over, you know, it's just a, it's a human experience that, that we all have with, with loved ones that are struggling. My son Jesse's born, and I can't be there for Mayor the way I had been. Hi, Justin, it's Mayor. I uh, hope you're all doing well. Leave on your message what a good time to call you back with me. We have stuff to talk about. So that was Mayor, and I feel like I need to go and do some shooting with them. Okay. I mean, I, don't, I just need all hands on deck here and it seems like you're either on a job or with Mayor all the time and it's driving me a little crazy. I mean, I know he's needy. I'm feeling kind of needy right now also and I just need you to keep that in mind. I will. I just, you know, I feel like I've come this far with him and I don't want to give up but I know it's got to change. So. What's the dialogue that you're having with, with, with your wife, Eden Wormfeld, who for my listeners is also a you know, filmmaker in her own, in her own right. What was the dialogue like with her? You know, it's important to note that Eden was pregnant in the film. You guys are pregnant with your second child. And, and yeah, I mean, you know, again, another one of those moments for me is, is, is she's, speaking directly to you and and I know this look I can see on her face she's incredibly tired she's worn out with you know from the kids from from taking care of things at home and 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 she says you know directly to you I just I you know Justin I just need all hands on deck and that is an absolutely heartbreaking moment and I recognize it it spoke to me personally you know I, I mentioned Steph and I have have two young kids ourselves and and I think it probably speaks to a lot of doc lifers this kind of being torn between you know, the personal and the professional and the creative. How are you guys handling this during the film? Yeah, I mean, I was so lucky to have Eden as my wife and the producer of the film because she certainly understands 
the process, but you know, clearly there was a point where, um, well, early on there were points where I was like, I don't think I can go on, and where yeah. she w- she was very supportive and and keeping me uh, in the, in it. Uh, but uh, then after Jesse, my second son was born, and and Mayor was feeling jealous um, oh. <laughs> that. Uh, that I wasn't spending time with him yeah. and I was feeling like the film was in some ways keeping him alive. Right. Um, but she was like, you know, we need, <laughs> we need to have a, an end game here. Um, yeah. and when you're dealing with suicide, I mean, and somebody's life and death, that's Ugh. the scary process. Um, uh, so yeah, she, uh, she said, listen, I understand you, you mayor needs you, but I need you more. Um, and so I had to kind of start separating. Um, and that's when I suggested we make a shorter film and he went crazy, uh, (laughs) like the narcissist in him, uh, which is, you know, the, I was, the film is very lucky to have mayor's humor in it as well, because, uh, without it, I, I don't think it would be watchable. Um, yeah, it, that's so, very true. That's a great point. Yeah. I mean, why do you think it was so important to Mayer to to have this story told? You know, as you mentioned, he gets very upset when you do come in to explain to him that hey, maybe this maybe this is a, a thirty minute film. You know, and 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 he he makes a quote early in the film. He says, "I wasn't just helping the giants." You know, referring to the people in the Yippie movement. I wasn't just helping the giants. I was helping them be giants. There's narcissism yeah. there, right? Yeah. Yeah, and it, and it is important to show his his narcissism. I mean, obviously, it's there, but um, uh, so I mean, wasn't your film also a part of his? You know, you know, the, the idea, the suicide was his last political political act, right? But but the film yeah. had to be for him as well. Yes, right? no question that he wanted. I mean, he saw the film as, as kind of the vehicle. Um, and we fought about this, you know, he, he, he wanted me to film his suicide. Um, and I refused, um, because I didn't want him to die and I didn't want to be a, a a reason for him to do it. You know, if he needed to to do this, obviously I couldn't stop him. I wasn't going to lock him up. He had been locked in mental hospitals before. Um, but I wasn't going to participate. Um, and he wanted, you know, the, the, one of the many great scenes that didn't make it was the scene where he said, you know, I, I want you to film it. I want you to get arrested. And I want like, uh, you know, everybody to be wearing shirts that say, let Justin shoot mayor dead. There um, it is. Right. And so, uh, and that, uh, but the question of why he wanted the film, I mean, it's not just narcissism. I really feel like in some ways mm. uh, he kind of was donating his sadness uh, in a beautiful way to um, share with the world. And, you know, this issue of suicide is, is, is one that's getting more and more pressing. The, the suicide rate for mayors, um, men mayor's for age men, has, right? du- has doubled yep. uh, in the past 10 years. And... Uh, I think that there are many reasons for that, um, but uh, you know, he wanted to share this experience. Um, you know, he was personally kind of advocating for his rights to mm. to end his life. Um, but the film is not about that. It's not an advocacy film, which may hurt the film in some ways because it's not a, it's not a clear agenda as you said but um, I'm so glad it wasn't I really am. yeah no I couldn't I couldn't create uh, an agenda that I didn't believe in and um, you know it, it's just more complicated than that I think I learned that you know suicide is a very uh, tragic and complicated thing and it's not it's a word that doesn't necessarily do justice to the many different situations I mean there are people that are terminally ill there are people that clearly can be helped with um, medicine and, and medical care. And, um, there are people that, you know, just decide that they've had enough. Um, 
So and, it's yeah, tough. we've had you know we've dealt with the um, the topic of suicide in documentary filmmaking a bit early on in the in the life of this show. We had a filmmaker, a Seattle filmmaker, uh, Scott Squire, who had done some filming up in Nepal. He and his wife Amy, and uh, uh, their chief subject, um, she ends up killing herself while they're back here in the states. And so the film becomes cool. something entirely different. Um, uh, so it, it, it's you know we we've talked about that you know now a couple of times here on mm-hmm. the on the program, and it definitely seems to be an epidemic that is growing, um, not only here in the states but of course worldwide as well in countries in developing countries like Nepal. So you've got a great idea for a documentary film. Awesome. I'd love to hear about it, but I don't have a ton of time. Can you tell me about it in 30 seconds or less? Oh, you don't quite have your pitch down yet. Okay, that's fine. What's your website where I can find more information? Maybe a press kit I can take a look at. You don't have one. Well, have you thought about how you might raise some funds to help with the costs of making films? They can be expensive, right? You haven't. Okay, maybe just tell me about your audience. Who's going to want to see your film? Who will you be marketing it to? You don't know this either. Okay, then I'm going to assume you haven't thought about how you'll be getting your film out into the world then, right? I think I see what's going on here. I was once in your shoes. A great idea for a doc. Camera in one hand, a boom mic in the other. But other than that, not much other than a whole lot of excitement and gumption. And that's great. You'll need all of that. But you'll also need a heck of a lot more if you're looking to make the kind of documentary film that you can be proud of. The kind that people will want to see and will impact them. The kind that won't break the bank while you're making it. And dare I say, you might even make some money from. You need support, and we've got you covered. We built the Documentary Academy with you in mind. We've got all the resources you need to make a successful documentary film you can be proud of. Come and enroll at thedocumentarylife.com slash academy, and let's turn that doc idea into a reality. Mayer says, and, and I'll quote this, Old people tend to think that their experiences are... Well, actually, I should give some context. I Mm -hmm. think he's saying this, and you're going to help correct me if I'm wrong. I feel like he was saying this at one of the um, protests or marches that you may have attended. Mm -hmm. He says something, old people tend to think that their experiences are what young people need to know. And I understand the tendency, but I think it's poison. That's a statement that, that definitely... It struck me. It struck it, it struck me as an amazingly acute statement, and and there's irony here involved as well because in a way, at least for me, I felt like it's exactly what he was doing with you. You know, you guys are sitting in the therapist's office, and he's telling you how you will feel later on with the film. You know, once it's finished and he's long gone, and yeah. I just yeah, I found some irony there, and I also found some some maybe even truth to what he is saying. Again, old people tend to think that their experiences are what young people need to know. And I understand the tendency, but I think it's poison. Yeah. I mean that he said that, um, in the wake of, I kind of dragged him down to the, um, occupy That's protest. Right, uh, right. Yeah. And I thought, Oh, maybe this will kind of reignite his, oh. His his activism and he he I was trying to convince him that I felt like he had an experience to share. He had been through this and yeah. um, and he had and but um, you know that movement. Abby Hoffman, who was a very close friend of Mayer's, uh, said, you know, don't trust anybody uh, over thirty. <laughs> and here's Mayer, you know, just past sixty and feeling, you know, how do you stay true to that? I mean, how do you participate in a movement, uh, you know, back when he was an activist and he was young, he didn't want some old fogies coming in and, uh, talking down to him. No, except that, that, you know, actually Abby was older and mayor did have, you know, mentors in the movement. Um, so I think part of that is, is wisdom. Certainly there's truth, to that, and part of it is the depression, kind of negating the the great value that he had right. in his experience. Um, well, I mean, I so, found that I I can't help but wonder if the current state of things here in the U.S. actually might have helped someone like Mayer stay alive. I don't know. Maybe like you're saying, the depression at some point may have just been too much. But I definitely found myself wondering about that. Like maybe he even would have thrived in this environment, given him some purpose again. Yeah. Has that occurred to you? Yeah, I mean, you know, we we we. I mean, I, I I'm speaking for myself and my political leanings, but I think uh, I think leadership 
from all stripes is lacking, uh, true kind of honest, inspirational leadership. Uh, and I think he had a lot to, sh to, to, to give and share about his experience and his perspective. That's why I started making the film. I mean, right. aside from any of, any of this other stuff. And, um, you know, I think that, uh, I grew up in the eighties when, uh, activism kind of was, was dead and it was all the me generation. Uh, and I looked back on the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement with a kind of longing that I, did I too. hope, yeah. <laughs> I did too. And I hope mayor could explain it to me and share it with me. And, um, you know, I, I got something that I didn't, uh, didn't expect. I've got a couple of, 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 of technical questions that I want to run by you here. Um, that, sure. that might be beneficial to some of my listeners. I, Technically, I have to know, how did you Mike Mayer? Because he's wearing these T-shirts the entire time, right? And you don't have a sound man there. It's you and the camera. How were you miking him? Because this sounds great. Or were you just taping the lav underneath his? Uh, when I could, I, I I have a you know a, a, a electrosonic, okay, uh, wireless mic that I would put on the inside of his t-shirt. Uh, you probably can see it sometimes. Okay. Um, so you were taping it from the inside. It's a, it's, I use a vampire clamp. Yep. Um, yep. Uh, but, and mayor, you know, would say kind of only half jokingly, like that putting the mic on was one of his favorite parts because he got <laughs> to be touched yeah. and, uh, oh, you know, man. which was not, which is true. And it was kind of sweet. Uh, yeah, and yeah. then I had a, you know, a, a mic on my camera, uh, it was the kind of film where aesthetics really had to be uh, come in second to keeping, you know, to keeping eye contact with him and making it intimate and and making it pretty uh, felt wrong to me. Yeah. Uh, so and it's not. It's pretty down and dirty. And um, I started out using, you know, the camera that I had, which was uh, an EX1 and okay, even though using the X1. yeah I, I i paused a couple of times when you when you kind of roll by the mirror and i was yeah. trying to figure out what the camera was yeah okay that's a yeah i know that routine yes. um <laughs> but uh you know and and during the filming i got uh c300 but i decided to stick with the same camera because yeah. just felt it felt right to be consistent and also just to be too to be too nice uh too much detail in that place where he was felt wrong so yeah it, it definitely I, I think you definitely made the right 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 choice there and, and of course you know aesthetically you and i both as cinematographers that would have been a drastic difference going from the from the ex1 to the to the c300 yeah um okay how did you get the okay from the physician to allow you to record the conversation he seemed very comfortable yeah. with the camera there yeah. How? I mean, <laughs> I, he had a long relationship with Mayer yeah. and, and kind of a certain kinship with him. And I just uh, that was very lucky. Uh, I felt that that's another thing that made the film seem important enough to keep going was yeah. that uh, Red, um, Dr. Schiller saw the importance in kind of documenting Mayer and the struggle he was going through and. And he, as a doctor, was frustrated that there wasn't that much he could do, yeah. uh, you know, besides uh, putting him in the hospital. Um, and he thought it was, uh, you know, he was very courageous. Um, and I, uh, and actually he's helping us now. We got a little bit of money from Sundance to do something called, uh, to, to do some work around helping uh, elderly people kind of think about and their caregivers think about different aspects of life that they need to prepare for. Oh man. Uh, from, we're calling it the elder pyramid, kind of like the food pyramid. Yeah. Uh, so he's helped us kind of create that dealing with social interactions, spiritual, financial. So, yeah. Tell me about the moment. Um, Tell me about the moment when you when you first walk in and and he has he has done his last political act. Uh, what kind of dialogue are you having with his people? Obviously, you walk in with with his two close old friends, right? Yeah. You guys walk into the apartment. Is this truly the first moment that you guys walk in there? And 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 how do you sort of set that up? Yeah, 
No, it was. What I kind mean, of what's what's the feeling that you have going in there? Yeah, I mean, I had you know, so I had dropped him off uh, from. We had gone to Texas to drop right. off his cat, which was. You know, once he did that, his he was his cat was his kind of closest. Living oh man, pen. that's uh, like the moment. I, I was like, yeah. "There's no going back." When I saw yeah. that, yeah. And you know, while we were in Texas, I told him many times that we can take the cat back to New York. It's, yep. Um But uh, so I thought that it was very possible that 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 he had uh, taken his life, uh, but you know, there's always this glimmer of. Maybe he's there sitting there watching TV. Oh, I um, thought that was going to be part of his act, right? I thought maybe he would just jump out and be like, hey, fooled yeah. you guys. This was my big act or something. I don't know. I think I was hoping for that. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, there's hope is a good thing. But uh, so I it was a difficult moment as a friend and as a filmmaker. How am I going to film this? What am I going to find? Right. What happens if he's in a coma? You know, uh, yeah, right, right. Like, you know, who knows? It's 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 a it's a horrible prospect. Um, and how am I going to frame it? You know, yeah. Uh, so that I have options. Um, is he going to? Where is he going to be? Uh, it's funny because uh, when I'm filming, I've filmed a few births before, um, mm-hmm. and you're like, "Is this for TV? How much can you see?" You know. Uh, right. well, how do you frame it? It's kind of both ends of life. You need to think about the framing. Um, but, uh, so, uh, I have to say that both, well, as, as, a, as somebody that loved mayor finding him the way I did where he was actually in a incredibly peaceful kind of repose yeah. was a, a great relief. Um, because he really was at peace. Uh, and so I was relieved by that. Um, you know, it's a strange thing when you find somebody like that. Uh, you don't know. I mean, he, you want to film it. You want to call the police. You want to. Um, so it, it and you want to get the reactions of, of his friends. Um, so it was challenging, but I feel like it, it, it worked out. Um, and we found the, the note that he had written, um, which helped us create the title. Right. Indeed. Something that I always do, Justin, when watching docs is, and I don't, I don't know if you do this or not. Um, I, I, I kind of like to think that probably a lot of us do is check the credits, right? You watch the credits for the thank yous, the grants, funding sources, et cetera. We already mentioned the Sundance documentary fund. What were some of the other funding sources for this film? Yeah, well, the, the first grant that we got, which was, you know, a huge um, uh, wind in our sails, was the Catapult, um, which is a small right. uh, grant uh, foundation in San Francisco that gave us money to uh, put together a trailer. Um, and, you know, they really... Uh, Appreciated. They said that they had like the, the most intense discussions around uh, the film, and that just uh, made us feel like we were doing something right. And right, you're on the right track. Totally. To keep going. Yeah. Uh, so they were great, and then um, Sundance as well, and we got a grant from the Jerome Foundation, uh, which was wonderful. So those things each each time you're kind of like wondering if it's gonna if we're gonna make it to the end um they not just give you money but they give you hope that you're doing something right did you find that people knew or these organ people from the organizations did you find that they knew who mayor was and if so did this help uh no they didn't know who he was um but they uh they were interested that he was somebody that kind of was behind the scenes and they wanted to know more. Um, you know, I saw this, I mean, there are many layers to this. And one of the things that I hope it does is kind of, uh, brings back a little bit of the history of the yippies and yeah. the, the work that they did. Um, certainly is, re- you know, is more relevant now than it's been in a while. Um, That's right. so, uh, you know, I didn't have, uh, any of the, you know, a lot of those activists also, um, took their own lives, which is right. part of Mayer's uh, story. Uh, Abby was uh, very close with Mayer uh, and Phil Oaks. Phil Oaks yeah. 
um, and a few others. And, uh, you know, that's part of, they call that uh, suicide contagion in a way. It, it, when somebody close to you takes their life, it, it, it opens up the possibility. And I feel like Mayer saw that as a, uh, as a possible way out because of that, um, which is, you know, really sad. I love hearing that there's other, there's more life than, you know, after a film, if that makes sense. And, and no pun, (laughs) no pun intended here. Uh, but you know, also in the instance with, with Scott and his wife, Amy and, 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 and their film that dealt with, 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 um, suicide as, as part of the subject or, or main part of the subject, there was a life beyond that because now they're giving, um, the suicide rate amongst amongst females in Nepal is extraordinary, mm. and now there's becoming um, a more awareness around that. And they yeah. have educational programs that they're actually taking, um, not only to Kathmandu but throughout villages in 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 in, in the countryside, which is yeah. which is a phenomenal thing. Not everybody, you know, th- there's no ob- you don't have an obligation. I will not argue that no one has an obligation as a doc filmmaker to do that. But it's lovely to see that there is life beyond just the film in that. Yeah. Way. Well, you know, I in in showing the film around the country and around the world this past kind of year and a half, I've been really struck by people coming up to me and talking about how they had gone through similar experiences with loved ones and that they really appreciate um, the the openness and the kind of taking this uh, difficult issue out of the shadows because you know survivors are um, are left to deal with it and. Um, and there's been a real taboo about talking about uh, this difficult road. Um, and so I think talking about it and sharing it is healthy. Um, and, you know, people have different opinions. People come to it with their own baggage. And occasionally I get people, uh, very occasionally, um, feeling like, uh, you know, something more should have, could have been done. I'm sure, um, yeah. But uh, for the most part, people have been really uh, grateful for the openness. Well, Justin, how do you handle that conversation when somebody somebody comes to you with that? Because that's it's just inevitably mm. going to happen, given given the content of the film and, and yeah. what happens. Yeah, uh, you know, it's happened like two or three times. Okay, uh, and the phrase I've gotten, which is shocking, is you know, death by documentary, like that somehow I've oh, contributed, <laughs> uh, and. I, I have to think that, you know, people may well have come to, to that conclusion based on their own life experience with suicide. And I try not to be judgmental. Right. Um, I mean, I can say honestly that I don't have any regrets uh, about the way my relationship with Mayer unfolded and, and the, the work I did to try to be there for him. Um, that I feel like the film in in some ways extended his life in a good way. Uh, it may have also precipitated his death. I don't know. Um, but I don't have regrets and that I, you know, it's complicated. There, There's certainly, I feel like if Mayer were alive today and, and miserable, that it necessarily, it wouldn't necessarily be a better outcome. So, uh, but yeah, no, it's uh, also, I would say some of the times that people accuse me of that, they haven't seen the film, uh, that they've only read about it. And, right, right. Uh, so often I say, let's talk about this after you see the film. Mayor Vishner always had an agenda. For the last years of his life, it was about his death. And in the end, I was no match for it, or the depression that consumed him. But the impact of Mayer's life is much greater than the way it ended. And I choose to celebrate that. Justin, as we finish up here, one of the things that, you know, one of the things I tend to ask my guests deals with this idea of a documentary life, right? And we kind of define that here on the show as, as how people are living while practicing their passion of documentary films. Now, because not a ton of people truly make their entire living from doing the documentary work, you know, I, I have listeners, you know, who are teachers. I, I have a, a guy who emails with me who's a gas station attendant, plenty who work in the service industry, right? This is what sure. keeps them afloat while they make their films. 
I work in commercial and corporate video as a freelance camera op and then as a director DP through my wife's and, and my production company. How are you, Justin, how are you living your documentary life? How would you describe that? Well, it, you know, it's obviously it evolves over time. Mm -hmm. um, I started out, as I said, as an assistant editor uh, and then an assistant cameraman and I uh, really uh, started making a living as a cameraman. So, which is a very, is a luxury because when people raise money, then they can call you. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't mean you don't give them a deal and you don't uh, appreciate their, their struggles, but, um, you know, it allows you to make a living and then you own gear and you rent that out, um, while you're trying to develop your own projects. Uh, and then, uh, as you do, I work on commercial things. I do shooting for Apple computer. Right. Uh, and I do a lot, you know, shooting for other documentaries. Uh, and you know, I feel very privileged at this point in my career where I can get some grants and, uh, that helps a lot too. Uh, but, and then my wife works both on documentary and on feature films, uh, but it's uh, it's tough, and I mean, luckily, I think that the means of production in documentary have become much more reasonable, and uh, it's opened up storytelling, nonfiction storytelling, to to everybody, uh, which is a wonderful thing. Uh, and now the challenge is just getting getting it seen through all that clutter. Of course. <laughs> it's funny, uh, Justin, I feel like, you know, the, doing in, in having done some of the research about, about you and, and, and having watched the film and, and now through this discussion, I feel like you and I run some parallel lives. It's crazy stuff is, sure. uh, whereas cool. my, you know, my work tends to come from you know, the commercial and the documentary work, work Steph's is, is pretty exclusively in, in feature films. Now she's uh -huh. from, from the UK. So a lot of her work has been based out of the UK or in Malaysia actually, which is where I met her. Um, uh -huh. cool. but, uh, yeah, it, and, and then of course we had the two kids and of course your kids are, are older now. Yeah. We're all in our own way living documentary lives, aren't we? <laughs> yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's a great privilege. Uh, it's so, and then, you know, in this film, I, I, my kids are in it. And so it's, yeah. I can look back and, and smile every time I see them in the film. Uh, so that's nice too. Justin, tell us how we can see left on purpose. It's a wonderful film and I want everyone to see it. Thanks. Um, well, it's, uh, this February 10th, which is, uh, coming up soon. It's going to be available, uh, on digital platforms, iTunes, uh, Amazon, Vimeo, uh, Google something or other. Um, <laughs> uh, we have a website left on purpose.com. I'm sure all that information will be there. Uh, certainly if you go to iTunes or Amazon and if you live in New York city, it will be screening at the cinema village, uh, on, uh, 12th street in New York for a week. It's also starting February 10th. And, uh, I'm going to be at quite a few of those screenings. So, you know, please join me and, uh, you know, it's a film that uh, it, seeing it with a group and then having a discussion afterwards, you know, really is fulfilling because it uh, brings up a lot of a lot of issues that that people can talk about and share. So it's definitely that kind of film, and uh, I'm eager to continue the discussion. You know, hopefully with with uh, with with my listeners. Um, after, you know, hopefully long after we, they've seen the film and, and we've had Great. the program air. Uh, Justin, what an honor. Thank you so much for, Thank for, you. for joining me today. I'm glad that you reached out. Um, I hope in the future maybe that uh, Steph and I get to get to meet you in Eden and, yeah, and please. our families get to meet. That'd be awesome. That sounds great. And uh, thank you. I mean, I really enjoyed talking with you. Please keep in touch, Justin. I'd love to have you on again. And, and, and I want to see, see where this all goes for you. Cool. Thanks. Have a great day, man. Hey, can I ask a quick favor? If you found this podcast helpful in living your doc life or making your doc film, will you help us share it with more people by giving us a stellar review on whichever platform you use to listen to this podcast? We'd really appreciate it. And you'll be helping the doc filmmaking community find us. Thanks again for listening and we'll see you in the next episode.
Thanks again for listening to the show, and remember to like and subscribe to this channel. Also, remember for any of the URLs that may or may not be outdated, and you want to get the most up-to-date information, perhaps for the documentary filmmaking courses, for the blog, for other episodes, just go ahead and check in the show notes below on this YouTube page, and that'll give you the correct URLs to use. Thanks again. Have a great day.